Hello folks, in this video I'll be demonstrating the basics of shaders using GLSL and the game framework Love2D. Essentially, a shader is some code that recalculates how each pixel should look. In this simple example, a shader is running on the player character, turning it grayscale. And also, a shader is creating this ring of light. And I'll go through how all of this works. I have this barebones Love2D project here that I'll be demonstrating things with. You can check the description if you want the full source, but it's just a background image, a player parrot sprite, and then in the main.lua, we have a player object, and then the update function has player movement, and then down in draw, this is the main section that we'll be working with, is we're drawing the background, and we're also drawing the player sprite. I can scroll all the way over to the right, but it's all a very simple project. And there's no shaders in here yet. When I run right now, I just have the simple scene with the bright red player parrot. To start writing our own shaders, I think it would be best to keep everything in its own file. So I'll create a new shaders.lua. And in this file, I'm going to make a local shaders table. And in this shaders table, we're going to store all of our different shader scripts. And I want us to start with a really simple one. I'm going to say shaders.whiteout equals love.graphics.new shader. And then we're going to put open and close square brackets like that. In between these square brackets, we can write some GLSL code, which is the OpenGL shading language. In general, most of your GLSL scripts are going to be formatted like this, a vec for effect function. This effect function that we're implementing, Love2D specifically uses this as the entry point. What's going to happen is Love2D will pass in a bunch of graphics data into this function. We're going to write some code that makes adjustments to that data, and then we're going to return a vec4 that represents the updated colors. So to fully make this work, we need to accept some specific parameters within this function. The first is going to be a vec4 color, which is the color that Love2D is currently applying to its textures. We're going to have image texture, which is the specific sprite or image that's being analyzed by the shader. Next is going to be the vec2 texture coords, which represents the x, y position within the sprite that we're altering. And then finally, the vec2 screen chords. And this is the XY position on screen or on the canvas. Now I know that's a lot of different parameters and we're going to utilize each one by the end of this video, but it really is necessary in order for the shader to work that we have all of these in place. But for now we're going to finish off this simple example by just returning. So return vec4 1 1 1 1 and don't forget the semicolon. So this represents the RGB color alpha that we're replacing the sprite with. So for our shaders.whiteout script, we're replacing each pixel with 1111 or full white, full opacity. And that should be all the GLSL code that's needed to get this script up and running. Now all we need to do is call it properly from main.lua. So what I'm going to do is actually return shaders. So this shaders table that we added to, we're going to return it. And over in main.lua, if I scroll all, all the way to the top, I can require it. Shaders equals require shaders. And now this table will contain everything that's in this shaders table over here. And with that, we can scroll down to the draw function in order to set the shader. We'll do this with love.graphics.setShader. And then the, the shader we want to set is shaders.whiteout. So once this line is set, everything from this point onwards is going to be impacted by this shader code. And we can see this ourselves. If we save everything and run, all of the graphics in the game got impacted by the shader and it recolored everything to be white. But this isn't very useful to whiting out everything. So what you can do is you can deactivate a shader by doing love.graphics.setShader empty, like that. 
So what's going to happen is the whiteout shader is going to become active, the background is going to be drawn, and then the shader will be deactivated, so that means the player draw will not be impacted by the shader. If I save and run, we can see the player is in a white background, and similarly we can do the same sort of process where we have this running on the player, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to reorganize this code slightly. So it's the same thing, but we're drawing the background, and this time we are whiting out, or we're setting the whiteout shader, drawing the player, and then deactivating the shader. So this means that the player will be impacted by it, and we see our background, but the player this time, it's kind of odd, the player is recolored to be white, but it's a full filled in square shape. And this is because images are always rectangular. If I go to parrot.png, the image is still a rectangle. If you look closely, there's transparent pixels for the background. And this is the problem. Our current shader is taking all of these transparent pixels and turning them into opaque white pixels. So to fix this, all we need to do is retain the transparency values when applying the shader. So what we need to do is we need to get information on the current pixel, specifically its alpha value. And Love2D offers a convenient way to do this. I can say vec for pixel equals, and there's this function that Love2D provides, texel. And we can pass in texture and texture chords. Don't forget the semicolon. So if you're using GLSL outside of Love2D, the syntax for this portion probably will be a little bit different, but in Love2D, this function here is going to provide us the pixel information that we're currently analyzing through the shader, and we can directly access the alpha value and pass it in, pixel.a. So we get the alpha value from pixel, and we pass it in to the returned value, and that should be enough to fix this issue. So the box around the player is no longer there. We can see the white gets applied to any pixels that are not transparent. Now, our next shader is going to have a bit more complexity than this first one. It's going to give our game a light system, where the game has darkness, and light sources in the game pierce that darkness using a shader. And when I say darkness, I mean a simple overlay that covers the screen. I'll start by setting the color of this overlay, love.graphics.setColor. We'll have this set to a black overlay, 0, 0, 0, with an alpha value of 0 0.75. This 0 0.75, this means it's 75% opaque, so it has some transparency. And then we're going to draw the overlay itself. It's really simple. It's just a love.graphics.rectangle, and we're going to draw it as a filled-in rectangle. We'll start at 0, 0, and then the width is going to be the width of the screen. I'll just put in 1920 by 1080. So all this is, is this is a rectangle that's going to cover the screen using this color. And also, since I'm using set color here, I need to make sure I reapply set color properly as 1, 1, 1, 1. We need this line up here, otherwise everything in the game is going to be impacted by the overlay coloration. And if I save and run now, you'll see what I mean is that the game is the same as before, but now there's like a dark black overlay that's kind of see-through, but not really. This is going to be the darkness that we work with. And our goal is to create some sort of like hole punch into the darkness so that you can see through it and reveal the light. And to implement this, the code is going to be very similar to before. In fact, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to say shaders.light. And we can keep all of the rest of this code and start from here. Because the texture in this case is the dark overlay rectangle, so the code we write next is going to be running on that part of the scene specifically. We also need a point to place our light source. I'll test it out with a vec to center, that's the name of the variable, and it's going to be a vec2 at position 400, 300, with a semicolon. So the way our hole punch light is going to work is by running a distance check. Anywhere that's close to a light source will be made transparent. This will look like float distance equals, and we'll call the length function. Then we can just pass in screen coords minus center. And then don't forget the semicolon. 
So this is going to get us the distance between whichever point we're looking at on the screen and the light source position, which is going to be center. Now that we have that distance, we can do a condition. If distance, let's say, is less than 250, that's going to be the radius of our light source. So if distance is less than 250, then we're going to return a vec4, and this is going to be a fully transparent color. But if it's not less than 250, then we're going to return pixel. But actually not just pixel, we want to return pixel times color. Because color here represents this set color that we were using in love.draw. So we want to make sure that we retain this set color property during the shader calculation. So make sure that we are returning pixel times color here. And that should be enough to add a single light to the scene. But we need to make sure that the correct shader is running on the darkness. So this is the overlay here. So what I want to do is I want to call love.graphics.setShader and we want to start shaders.light. And also don't forget that we want to stop that shader once it's done running on the overlay section. I'm also going to take out the whiteout shader for now so we can see the graphics a little bit better with the light source. So I'm going to save and run and we can see that our shader is working. It is cutting out a section of the overlay so we can see straight through to the regular graphics below. But in order for the shader to actually be useful, we'll want the light source to follow the player's position. And this is tricky because currently all of the values that we use in our GLSL code is manually coded in, like the 250 or the center point. But now we need to use a type of variable that interacts with our Lua code. So I'm going to remove this center point here. And instead, we're going to use a new type of variable, extern. I'll say extern vec2 player position. How this works is the shader code receives a value externally for this value. So we are going to send the player position to this variable in the shader code, and then we can use it in the code here. So don't forget, before we do anything else, since we removed center, I'm going to replace it with player position like that. And now to send the data to this player position variable, we want to do this every single frame so it's always accurate and up to date. And back in our main.lua, in the update loop where we are updating the player's position, after all that's done, we can go ahead and do shaders.light colon send. And the first parameter here is the name of the extern variable that we want to send to, which is player position. And then the next parameter is going to be the value that we want to send. And since this variable is a vec2, that's represented by a table of two values, that's player.x and player.y. So player.x, player.y is going to be sent into the player position extern variable in shaders. So then player position is going to be used for the distance calculation. I think that as it is now, it should follow the player's position wherever you move. One final detail I want to change is making the light source fade out towards its edges rather than being a solid circle of light all the way around. We can do this by adding a little bit more logic here. After the distance calculation, I'm going to calculate a fade value. I'll say float fade equals distance divided by 250. And actually more than this, I want to make sure that it's between a value of 0 and 1. So I'm going to say clamp I'm going to say clamp distance divided by 250 between a value of 0.0, .0 and 1.0. So this is going to ensure that our fade multiplier is always between 0 and 1. And then instead of a distance check like this, I can simply say pixel.a, the pixel that we're working with, we're going to change its alpha value to pixel.a times fade. So we're multiplying this fade multiplier by the alpha value and then returning that same pixel. And that should result in a faded light source effect like this. 
At this point the light is looking pretty good, but there's still more you could do here. If you wanted multiple light sources, you could X-turn an array of positions and then iterate on all of them. You could add some coloration to the light areas, add some motion to the radius, and this is still just the absolute basics of shaders. By the way, all of the code from this video is on GitHub, and in this shader.lua file, I included a few extra shader samples that you could try out, like the grayscale filter, which calculates an average of all of the RGB values and applies that, and there's also the multi-light shader, where there's an extern array of positions in order to render multiple light sources. If you found this tutorial helpful, please leave a like. I'll do my best to respond to any questions in the comments too. Thank you so much for watching!